go ahead and get started. Uh, this is a city council special meeting. Today is Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. It is 5.32 p.m. and we are presently at council chambers at the City Hall Building, 100 South Monroe Street, Eagle Pass, Maverick County, Texas. We begin with the establishment of quorum. We do have a quorum today with Mayor Pro Tem Ramon, Councilman Diaz, Councilwoman Cruz, and myself, Mayor Salinas. Absent today is Councilman Davis. Moving on to moment of reverence, as always, if we can take a moment of reverence for all our military serving uh, here and overseas. Thank you very much. Moving on to citizens communications and recognitions. Do we have any Madam Secretary? Yes, submitted please. Thank you. Public hearings, item number one. Public hearing on the City of Eagle Pass annual budget for fiscal year 2022, 2023 and possible action. We will open the public hearing at 5.33 p.m. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes, Mayor, Council. Good afternoon. Um, so this public hearing is, of course, to receive public input on the annual budget, which has been posted online for approximately a month. Um, state law does require that action be taken at the end of the public hearing. Uh, the way it's set up is a little odd, but the recommended action is actually to set the date of adoption for September 6th. Okay. So at this time, we'll open it up for any comments from the public that you, that you may have on the proposed annual budget. Does anybody have any any comments? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh, please. Um, yes, I, I'm uh, helping uh, Ms. Castaño and uh, the rest of the team to actually uh, prepare for the Christmas uh, dinner, uh, okay. Christmas uh, party. Uh -huh. And I'm afraid that it's, you know, $5,000 is way uh, too less actually you know um, prepare for over 300 people and I was wondering if there's a possibility of increasing that uh, at least to 15,000 instead of five I mean just just to please yes. uh, and, and so that's something we can definitely entertain ultimately because it is the proposed budget is already submitted we would need to you know if, if council wants to increase that amount we would have to find somewhere else to reduce Okay. Um, however, we would also need to specify what those expenditures would be for because legally there are some things that can be covered and others that cannot. Oh, it's just food decorations, yeah. but mostly it's food. Yes. Only. Yeah, so, so. We, we would need to just consult with, uh, with legal. Uh, I guess we can sit down with Ms. Ms. Castaño to, to go over those items and what's planned. So we make sure we comply with that section and first. And I know but that we're going to need more and we can find sponsors and everything, but at least for, for dinner to, yeah. to just uh, cover that. And, and we're asking for different options, but still, we need a yeah. little bit more. We'll, we'll explore that. Um, we, we will probably have to come back on the third reading to actually make any changes, because we'll need to review where we can take the money okay. from. But yeah, we'll definitely take time to abide. And another question. I noticed that uh, there's some uh, repairs that might be needed uh, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty soon here in the city hall. Is there uh, enough budget to cover those uh, uh, soon within this year? So we, within CIP, uh, remodeling of City Hall was originally included and was funded. The issue is, is that some other projects have gone over slightly and so that amount has, we've been taking from the City Hall allocation. So one of the items actually when we discuss CIP later on in the presentation will be to actually discuss that we still want to move forward with the designing um, so that we can determine the cost so that we can finalize how much money we need to do those improvements because there's a lot of things that we do need to address. I know first and foremost the, the roof, uh, but we also need to look at the plumbing. We also want to look at remodeling the old PD side for additional office space. So there's a lot of things that we want to take into consideration, um, but first and foremost we need to design and figure out what that cost will be. So we will actually be asking for authority to move forward with some of those items later on in the, in the agenda. The proposed budget has already been posted on our website. Yes. So uh, if anybody has questions, they can go sure. on our website and take a look at the budget, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, the day it's going to be entered it is next Tuesday? For the final adoption, correct. Okay. And everything has remained as you have discussed with us and as you have advised us. 
Yes, yeah, and unless council takes any formal action changing the proposed budget, the proposed budget remains exactly the same. I, I still have a couple of questions, but I will go directly to the office. Okay, okay. definitely. So that we can go over it one okay. by one. Okay. The public uh, hearing is still open for any additional comments or concerns regarding the proposed budget. So if there are none, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing at 5.37 p.m. And at this time, I'll entertain the motion to set the date for the adoption of the, of the budget to be September 6, 2022. I'll make a motion to I have a, a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ramon. I'll second. Second by Councilman Diaz. Discussion, all in favor, unanimous. Item two, public hearing on the proposed City of Eagle Pass 2022 tax year tax rates. We'll go ahead and open this public hearing at 5.38 p.m. Yes. So just as a recap from the previous meetings, so the proposed tax rate is 0 0.499160 per $100 value, which is a maintenance and operating uh, tax rate of 0 0.290068 and an INS rate of 0 0.209092, which is 4.15 cents than the previous year. Less. Yes. Okay. At this time, we'll open this up for uh, public comments or any concerns that anyone has. Councilwoman? It's just, I, I had a question, maybe I missed reading it, but the second paragraph, uh, it says that it, will, that it will raise the same amount of property tax revenue for City of Eagle Pass. I'm just making sure that that word's not saying that it will raise eventually. We are actually going down. Um, I'm not familiar with exactly the page that you're referring to, um, but I do know that the... Because it says on tax increase instead of decrease. The notice of public hearing. What yes. page are you referring so, to? Oh, they're just notifying us that it increased and therefore we're going down. Right? Yes, yeah. so, the, so there's no... The, the important word that's not on here is rate because we will receive more tax dollars, but the tax rate will be less. I wanted yes. to make sure... Correct. <laughs> Okay. Any other additional comments? Okay, if we have none, we'll go ahead and close this public hearing at 5.39 p.m. Do we need to take action on this? No. No action, okay. Item three, public hearing on the request submitted by the TerraTech Engineering and Construction Services on behalf of Eagle Pass Ranch Partnership for the annexation of proposed 1.892 acres out of Survey 1, Abstract 426, being part of Eagle Pass Ranch Partnership, 823.38 acres, described in Volume 407, page 28 of the Maverick County Deed Records of Land Lying and Situated in Maverick County. We will open this public hearing at 5.40 p.m. Mr. Madera. Yes, Mayor Council, thank you. So this item is... Uh, the public hearing portion, the recommendation will be presented under item 11 later in the agenda. So the information for this item is that it is a 1.892 acre tract of land. It is not a typical annexation being that it is a road strictly. Generally we have some type of land that someone wants to develop and then there's roads and other public infrastructure that tie into that new land being annexed. This is strictly roadway being annexed. Um, tech services, the applicant, and the <coughs> location is off of US Highway 57. The area surrounding is zoned industrial. There are utilities running through the highway um, near the, in the vicinity of this annexation. Here's an area map showing Highway 57 running up towards the top right of your screen, and then loop 480, where it meets 57. The dashed lines that you could see on the map are what is currently city limits. So that portion was annexed as part of the 2018 annexation. Uh, it does include- What portion, I'm sorry? In 2018, Okay. this particular area, along with uh, two other areas reaching out to 480, were annexed by the city of Eagle Pass. Uh, 57 to 480, El Indio to 480, and 277, Torres Carrizo. Those three areas 
have similar, I guess you could say rectangular shapes where they annex the roadway out just past 4A. In this particular case, it's a thousand feet to each side. That's why it looks pretty even how, how far it is to each side there. And uh, the other important thing to notice here to note is the blue box. It's an approximate location of where the road being built is. And so the portion outside of the dash line is what is being proposed for annexation here. And wh where does that road lead to, the, the one that's not annexed? It's currently mostly raw land, undeveloped land. There is a master plan that I'll show you in a few slides that'll give you a little bit better picture of that. That's a good question. It's more understanding. Yeah, I understand that. Mm -hmm. I had the same question. Thank you for asking. Yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Here's another uh, image. This is part of the construction plan sheet for the road construction. <coughs> And there's the yellow, I apologize for that blurry look here. I'm not sure what, why it's coming up that way, but the yellow line shows approximately based off of from 57 in the roadway where that annexation line. So everything past outside of that. And in blue, that blue rectangle will be the part of the road for this annexation. Um, what I did want to show is some of the details of that road. I do feel it's pertinent because Obviously, by annexing the road, the city's taking that on. It becomes the city's responsibility to maintain. So some of the details is they're using geogrid under the base, which is not part of the city's requirement for pavement. They're using an 18-inch flexible base. That's the thickness of the base. The city requires eight inches, so they're going thicker. Uh, they're using three-inch industrial grade asphalt. The city's minimum is 1.5, so again, they're exceeding the minimum standard. And the road is approximately 2,400 feet long. A thousand feet of that is already part of city limits. Service plan, I'm not gonna go too much into these details, but it just shows police, fire, building inspection, planning and zoning, library, streets, stormwater, street lighting, water, sanitary sewer, solid waste. Those are the components of the uh, service plan that the city would need to provide here. Um, in this case, it's just a road, so it doesn't increase too much um, a lot of the services, uh, you know, there's an incident right on the road, then technically that would be police, but outside of that is county, which would be still sheriff. Uh, similar, similar, well, fire already protects the <coughs> county, uh, library, things like that. So it wouldn't really cause a big impact because there's not much development or homes or new people there. Uh, department comments, I did want to let council be aware um, when city secretary sends out the information to the departments to make sure we can service, we did receive some concerns from public works and engineering regarding, at, the, at that time we didn't have the master plan, we didn't know exactly what was gonna go around the area, we did receive that afterwards and we now have that. And um, they were trying to understand the benefit to the city. If the city annexes a road and has to maintain the road but all the property around it remains county and is not taxable by the city for property taxes, you know, how, do, how does that work out or what, what is the benefit? So that was a concern brought up uh, from some of the departments, uh, including fire. Fire chief also brought up a similar concern. And police also mentioned just in general the, the fact that the more we annex, the more uh, area, the more distance that police needs to cover. But I did want to make sure council was aware of those, those comments. So what is the benefit to the city? And in, excuse my ignorance, I, mean, no. I don't know. What is the benefit? Is it, if it's just a road, what is the benefit to the city? Or is there a benefit to the city? Yes. I mean, other than that's, that's the know. big, most important question here. And the, mm -hmm. and the answer to that is, in discussing with the administration, what we're looking at is the potential for that to continue. Uh, Mr. Levine, the property owner of this particular, it, it was currently just a dirt road access easement, same access easement that the city would use to get to 20 acres the city owned, uh, Tim's Welding, several people own land there, and he maintained this easement. He'd sold many of those tracks off and maintained this easement that he allowed everybody to use to get to those properties. In this case, he's developing the road that will tie into his several hundred acres, 500 plus acres in the rear of this road. And so uh, the, the thinking is that by Proceeding with this, it increases the chances of future annexation for develop for when he develops those areas um, directly where this road ends, basically what this road connects to. And the road 
It's also unusual if somebody just builds a road mm -hmm. without developing tracts of land at this point. So, but that also ties back to just preparing that land, Mr. Levine and, and the ownership group, preparing that land to <coughs> develop and hopefully to annex. There is no guarantee. You know, that's a big point I think that we would all need to know. Well, I, I would like to move yeah. to take this into executive session only because we've had, you know, plenty of issues with. If, if, if I may, this pardon is, for interrupting, this is just the public this hearing. This is yeah. the public hearing. Okay, perfect. You, you, okay. Well, once we get to 11, okay. we'll do that. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask too uh -huh. many questions too, but I'm just uh -huh. waiting for you. Yes. 11 uh, we'll, we'll wait. We'll Thank you, Mr. So Mr. just very quickly, I'll cover a couple more quick details. The drainage will be modified in that it will go to the end of the road versus now just, you know, natural, it's not natural land and, and kind of runs southwesterly. Mm -hmm. um, that does have a cul-de-sac for emergency management vehicle, mm -hmm. like fire trucks would be able to turn around at the end of it. Uh, it does have a 12 inch water line that is also being put in here. So the developer is putting in a lot of infrastructure and essentially dedicating or donating to the city. So it's not all burden, it is, you know, an asset that the city is receiving at the same time. So I think that's also something to consider. Mm -hmm. Uh, not sanitary sewer, just wanted to make that point. 12 inch water line, but sanitary sewer is not part of this construction. And here's the master plan. So here's the final uh, slide as part of this presentation. So just show you one more time. Again, the blue rectangle here at the bottom up to that red line is the road. The part that's highlighted in yellow is an approximate of what would be annexed. The other part is already part of city limits, uh, part of a previous annexation. The city of Eagle Pass does have property here, approximately 20 acres that this new road and annex road, proposed annex road would uh, connect to and add service, a service road to. Uh, this rally RALI subdivision is already in progress development. There is a industrial uh, project going on here. And so there are signs that you know, some of this development, this area is already developing and we, we hope the benefit would be for the city to annex that and try to maintain it and, and uh, zone it to where we have an orderly development of the area. Uh, the blue outside the, or in the red outline area would be additional roadway proposed as part of the owner's master plan with several tracks, they vary in sizes, five acres, four or five acres and some larger that would also uh, potentially be more industrial zoned areas. And then it would uh, also include an additional roadway connecting back to Highway 57. So that concludes the presentation and we'll make our recommendation and again in item 11. Uh, right. I'm sure there's any other public comments. Since this is a public hearing, do we have any, any comments from the public regarding this item? Again, we're gonna come back to this. So. Thank you, Mr. Madera. If there aren't any comments from the public, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing at 5.50 p.m. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and move on to item number four, which is uh, well, several consent agenda items. As you know, the consent agen ag agenda is designed to assist in making the meeting shorter. Right now, I'm, I'll ask if any council member wishes to discuss a consent agenda item, please let me know and we can remove it from the consent agenda. I would like to remove item number five to be discussed individually. Besides item five, are we good on the other ones? Yes. All right, well, we'll go ahead and read the, the ones on the consent agenda. Item four. Second reading of an ordinance determining the public necessity for public use and authorizing the acquisition of a fee simple interest of 2.2 acres, survey six, abstract 1110, Fox F and J Byrne, MCAD property ID 541849.33 acres, survey six, abstract 1110, Fox F and J Byrne, MCAD property ID 4653 and 4.94 acres, survey six, abstract 1110, Fox F and J Byrne, MCAD property ID 54913, all situated in the city of Eagle Pass, Maverick County, Texas, for construction of the Main Street Detention Pond project, the property shall be acquired by negotiation and or condemnation if necessary. 
for the construction of a detention pond and authorizing the city manager or his designee to take all appropriate actions to require the fee simple interest in the property by negotiation and or condemnation. Item six, consideration and possible approval of a resolution authorizing the submission of a grant application with the Office of the Governor, Public Safety Office, Homeland Security Grants Division for specialized equipment. Authorizing the city manager to act on behalf of the city of Eagle Pass in all matters related to the application and pledging that if the grant is received, the city of Eagle Pass will comply with the grant requirements of the Office of the Governor and the state of Texas. Item seven, consideration and possible approval of a resolution authorizing the submission of a grant application with the Office of the Governor, Public Safety Office Homeland Security Grants Division for FY 2022 Operation Lone Star. Authorizing the city manager to act on behalf of the city of Eagle Pass in all matters related to the application and pledging that if a grant is received, the city of Eagle Pass will comply with the grant requirements and the Office of Governor and the state of Texas. Item eight, consideration and possible approval of a resolution authorizing the submission of a grant application with the Office of the Governor, Public Safety Office, Criminal Justice Divi Division for the year 2023 Bullet Resistant Shield Grant Program. And item nine, consideration and possible approval of a resolution of the City Council of the City of Eagle Pass, Texas, updating and amending authorized representatives for Texpool Investment Services. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve these consent agenda items. Mm -hmm. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ramon, a second by Councilwoman Cruz. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. We'll go back to item number five. Second reading of an ordinance amending sections 26-183, parentheses three, 26-185, parentheses one, and 26 186 parentheses three, article seven, chapter 26, traffic of the code of ordinances of the city of Eagle Pass, Texas to modifying commercial toll rates and to reduce the hours of free parking at the city parking lot and include a towed vehicle fee. Finding that the meeting at which this ordinance is passed is open to the public as requir required by law, providing a severability clause and establishing an effective date. Mr. Valderas. Yes, hello, good afternoon, hello, Mayor, Council. Um, so this is obviously the second reading to what we had proposed uh, on the uh, toll tag, the uh, uh, commercial toll um, uh, adjustment, and the parking lot. What we did um, is we made a small revision to the proposed toll adjustment. What we're trying to do is we're trying to mirror the World Trade Bridge in Laredo. And in conversations with them, um, they pretty much force every commercial vehicle that's crossing through their bridge to be on the toll tag system, right? So that's what we're trying to apply here. However, in, in very rare cases that they have a commercial vehicle that, uh, that for whatever reason can justify why they should not um, sign up for the toll tag, they apply an additional fee to allow them to pay uh, without the toll tag, or in other words, cash, right? So that is something that we're trying to do uh, with our bridge is to kind of mirror the way that they, uh, they handle their commercial traffic operations. So we made a revision to the uh, already proposed to include an additional 50 cent fee for any commercial truck that can justify being the exemption to cross without the toll tag. So that's the revision that we made. And our recommendation is if council and mayor can approve this so that we can we can apply it. So pretty much, in other words, our goal is to make it mandatory for every commercial vehicle that crosses through our bridge will need to use the toll tag and will pay the 550 uh, toll fee. Um, for those rare occasions that we have a commercial vehicle that can justify, you know what, I don't need the toll tag. I'm never going to cross through here again. You know, you're, you're wasting my time and making me get this. We would allow them to do that. However, we would charge them an extra 50 cents to be able to do so. So that's our recommendation is to apply this so that we can ensure that 99.9% .9 of all our commercial vehicles are on the toll tax system. And we're pretty confident that there's no reason why none of our commercial vehicles will not want to be on the toll tax system. It's going to be a faster way for them to cross. It's going to be easier for them to manage their, their accounts. 
So we feel like just by adding this, it just puts us at the level of World Trade Bridge in Laredo. So the extra 50 cents, just to be clear, it's for anyone that says they, they don't want to have the tag. Correct. That is correct. That's how they do it in Laredo? That's exactly how they do it in Laredo. Okay. Praxis. Pra Praxis. Praxis. Oh, yeah. Correct. Okay. So th that was the revision that we made, and uh, we would like to take this opportunity that we're presenting this to go ahead and implement that and kind of start moving in that direction of, of what the Port of Laredo currently does. W was it discussed at the bridge board meeting, the last one? Uh, unfortunately, this item, we reached out to Laredo after the fact, so okay. that's when we got that information, and then that's when we communicated to the uh, city administration that we'd like to present that revision to mayor and council and see okay. if it was approved to move forward with it. But you anticipate that most most of the commercial trucks, they'll, they'll, they'll want this system because yes. it's easier, right? Yes, a okay. lot easier. And like I said, it, it currently works for the World Trade Bridge in Laredo, which they handle about eight to 9,000 trucks a day. And uh, in my conversations with their team, they said it's extremely rare that somebody will not sign up for the toll tag. So our goal is to make sure that everyone takes advantage of this toll tag uh, uh, opportunity that we're providing to them. And in those very rare cases, you know, we would still allow them to cross, but just uh, adding a, 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 an extra fee. Okay. Does the toll tag cost have a, a specific cost? Or it's no, just it's absolutely free. Um, the only thing they would have to pay is obviously recharge their account, but that's their money, and then we would it's just. Pretty much, it works like the express card, yes. just to. It's a pre. To it's a prepaid tag. <coughs> okay. So that's so, that's I'll, our recommendation. With that said, I'll entertain a motion from council. I'll make a motion. Okay, I have, I have a motion to approve this modification by uh, Councilman Diaz, and a second by Councilwoman Cruz. Discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll go ahead and move to item 10, reports. Status of the emergency management plan for the city of Eagle Pass. Good afternoon, Jeez. Mayor Thompson. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, just really quick on uh, as far as where we stand with the emergency operation or emergency management plan. Yes, sir. A basic plan was submitted by Mr. Rodriguez uh, last week, uh, which puts us uh, in compliance. Um, while we transition to the emergency support function or the web-based portal for the state of Texas that uh, the city of Eagle Pass will, will now be utilizing. That's moving forward. Uh, I can report that um, 165 city employees have already completed the emergency management uh, training that consists of the ICS or incident command system 100 and 700. Uh, which is uh, beyond my expectations, to be honest with you. Um, everybody that uh, has taken it, we're, uh, uh, we support that, obviously, the more the merrier. Uh, but everybody who is um, obligated or required to take it has taken it at this time. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a plus for, for us moving forward. Um, as soon as we do move forward with the completion of the ESFs or the uh, plan, uh, you all will be uh, informed of that so that you can view it and uh, go from there. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez has done an excellent job in doing a lot of the legwork to put us where we are now. Uh, as a matter of fact, this morning we did uh, activate the EOC um, because of the, the flash flooding right. that we had. Um, we operated out of the Eagle Pass Police Department, so we thank the police chief for, for allowing us to utilize that training room. And um, everybody that needed to be involved was involved and everybody responded within the first 15, 20 minutes of that first phone call that, that was issued. Um, Public Works and the police department uh, were successful in blocking off a lot of the uh, roads in, in our area that are low line. And um, the necessary documentation was, was done and submitted to the state of Texas. I also can report that we are expecting heavy rain later on tonight or into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, we do have two teams from uh, Texas Task Force One who have responded uh, to our community, will be uh, staying at our fire department, and two other teams will be assigned to Ubalme, uh, 
so they will work out of this general area for whoever needs it, whether it's us or neighboring counties. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez uh, is also working on, um, on the training that's going to take place after we complete the emergency support function. And uh, one of the things that we are currently doing is that we're going to start implementing emergency management for uh, festivities that we have within our community to one, it provides training to everybody involved. Uh, we have direct communication and it's a team effort uh, and it'll prepare us for any future emergencies that we may have. But he has a presentation that uh, like will explain a little bit. The big events we have down there, Fourth of Park July. Park. And Absolutely. So we've been working uh, in conjunction with the police department and public works and parks and recreation. Uh, and uh, he's gonna present uh, what, what we're planning for for this upcoming event. Excellent. How you doing, Chief? Fine, sir, thank you. Uh, Good, I'll, I'll staying you dry. <laughs> so no major incidents today with the flooding? No, not, not and this affected any homes. Uh, we did have a report of two homes that in the county uh, that uh, suffered some very minor flooding damage. Uh, Mr. Polo Verma was also working out of our ASD, and he's dealing with uh, the documentation for yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you to the police department and public works. I saw the barricades and quickly, we acted quickly, so thank you very much. Mayor and Council, one, one of the other things that uh, emergency management was working on is uh, the contingency plans for what if on, on mass gathering special events. Uh, one of the areas that we is used more is Shelby Park. So we want to plan for or respond to potential risk and hazards associated with uh, mass gatherings. Um, I'd like to thank, thank all, many of all the directors. They've been very helpful. Uh, we've had several meetings to identify some, some, some weaknesses within our, within our uh, events downtown. Uh, so they've been very helpful. We've been using the uh, pre-event matrix that basically kind of guides us. We identify those potential issues that might uh, come up because every event, every event has this unique uh, situation and, and, and needs. So we're doing that. Uh, one of the areas that we identified down at uh, Shelby Park is parking, obviously, you know. So we do, we're working on the parking issue, traffic congestion, lighting, uh, control access to the event. It's pretty much an open event so anybody can just walk in. So we're, we're looking to, to see if we can get some temporary fencing to kind of uh, be able to monitor uh, entry and uh, exit uh, from the event as well. Uh, we're working on signage, written plans, radio communication, and events that event staff so they can be more identifiable. So people, general public can identify them as people working the event. They can approach them if they've had, had any questions. This this map itself, uh, public works has been very helpful. That area that you see uh, with a lot of parking areas, that area that uh, the uh, carnival usually, usually uses, but in those uh, times when the carnival is not there, we plan to use that area, as well as the area right under the event map to add additional parking. We were thinking between 800 and 1,000 additional vehicles could probably be parked down, down in that area. And what, what that would do is one of the, uh, for those of you that attended football games and when there's some bad weather coming in, they usually uh, vacate the, the stadium and says go take shelter in your vehicle. Take, trying to take shelter in your vehicle when your vehicle is way up here is very difficult. So we want to see if we can uh, put more vehicles closer to the event so they can shelter from the weather. It's going to reduce congestion from downtown area. It's going to improve traffic flow and provide our, provide area for handicap. We know that uh, we need to get those, those individuals that need to be closer to the event, make it more accessible to them. So we're going to provide a, a handicap area. Uh, it's a convenience for the attendees that will be uh, closer to the event. And it will get, add additional uh, parking revenue for those either nonprofit organizations or other people that are wanting to to uh, raise funds. So there'll be more vehicles to, and then we get the vehicles from the downtown area, so police don't have to have a heavy presence patrolling the downtown area because those vehicles are being left uh, alone. Um, one of the advantages of, of getting the temporary fencing is we can uh, supervise, marshal, and direct crowds access for emergency vehicles, egress and evacuation routes, and the, it will be the initial surveillance uh, and inspection for the attendees. 
We're working on a traffic plan, and we plan to use it on this next event, on this uh, the September. What we're planning to doing is making uh, Ford Street the uh, entry into the event, and then going around down Ryan, and then Rio Grande out of the event. So just a one way down, down there. Uh, and talking with the police department, we want to try it, see if that works. If it doesn't, well, we just throw in the trash and try something else. But we believe that the current situation, which we use Rio Grande to entry and exit, and then we have those two uh, pulgas that use it also as parking. They go in and out, so it really causes a heavy congestion in that entry point. So we're addressing that. <coughs> and like the chief mentioned, uh, we'll be using the forms, which kind of gets them familiar to the uh, to when we do activate the EOC. And that's basically the presentation. I don't know if you have any questions, or, but we are working on that. Uh, I just want to thank both of you uh, for all of the hard work that you put into your departments. I think it's this type of foresight that helps us be the great city that we are. And there's no doubt in my mind that anybody in our emergency uh, services team, whether it be fire or police, is not working to the highest of their capacity. So I just want to thank you for that and I hope to uh, see more of this in the future, you know, from, from, from all of our departments as we continue to develop. I, I, I see the growth of Eagle Pass rapidly just coming upon us, right? And so I want to make sure that we're ready and this is, this is great. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you. With everything going on, Chief, right, you never know what's going to happen. It could be, no, uh, unfortunately, the school or a big... We see it on the news you know, constantly, yeah, whether it's right. a parade, whether it's an event, yeah. uh, whether we're using a vehicle. Uh, we're going right. to try to keep weapons from going into the event as well. We're working with the police chief to uh, make signage to, to keep uh, prohibit weapons from actually... Right. We know that Texas is an open carry, but uh, we feel that the... the city has the authority of keeping those weapons from entering into the event. Right, and, and usually we have thousands of people that gather at those events, so it's great to have a plan. So is this finalized or is this something it's, moving? It's gonna be a constant uh, work, you know, we, we're gonna try things, see if they work. Obviously, as you've seen, some of the improvements for the parking areas, mm -hmm. I know we're talking with Mr. Sandoval, they do have some material there to improve the road access into the event, improving some of the parking areas. So we can limit the cost of doing these improvements. Right. But, uh, it, it'll be a constantly uh, uh, do it, see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. But we need to. Uh, I'm not uh, saying that the events haven't been a success because they have been, mm -hmm. but we're playing for the right. Safe. Uh, yes. yes. Better safe. Right. Yes. That saying. But thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. This is a thank you. good good stuff. Any questions? No? Thank you. Appreciate it. So that was just a, a status report. We'll move on to item 11. Consideration and possible approval of an ordinance providing for the extension of certain boundary limits of the city of Eagle Pass, Texas, and the annexation of certain territory lying adjacent to and adjoining the present boundary limits of said city, consisting of a tract con consisting of a total of 1.892 acres of land lying and situated in Maverick County, Texas, out of the I and G point N point RR Co survey one abstract 426 and being part of Eagle Pass partnership 823.38 acres described in volume 407 page 28 of the Maverick County deed records authorizing implementation of the service plan for said territory assigning thereto permanent zoning district classification all as described herein and approving for an effective date. I believe uh, we discussed this in a public hearing, but I also believe that somebody wanted to make a motion yes. to take this into yes. executive session, which we do have that motion by Mayor Butem Ramon. I'll second. A second by Councilman Diaz. Discussion, all in favor, unanimous. We'll take this item to executive session. Item 12, second reading of an ordinance approving and adopting the budget of the City of Eagle Pass, Texas for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and establishing procedures of formal approval by September 6, 2022, finding that the meeting at which this ordinance is passed is open to the public as required by law, providing a severability clause and establishing an effective date. Jesse. Yes. Yes, sir. Mayor Council, we're getting closer. Um, this is the, the calendar we've been following, so we're just after this meeting, 
one meeting away from the hopefully the adoption of, of the budget. Um, just to recap on some of the items that we did discuss. So the overall budget does call for the city bringing in just over $50 million, uh, $300,000, and an expenditure of just over $54 million. Of course, I have to point out, yes, we are spending more than what we are bringing in, but th those are planned because we set aside money for equipment for projects and then we pay for them. So it's not that we're gonna go into the red, it's that we're using money that we have set aside. Now, again, we, we always talk about this spreadsheet because this shows you in one uh, glimpse the entire city's financial status. And we did talk about most of these funds already, but today, you know, it's up to council. We want to talk about anything else, of course we can, but the focus that we have planned is to talk about the general fund, the bridge fund, the solid waste fund, the debt fund, and capital improvement fund, which are the largest of the city's funds. Um, so starting with the bridge system, we do have an expectation that we're gonna bring in just over $16.7 million. Uh, we do expect to completely recover from the downturn that we did see with COVID. And the fees that we've talked about, including the commercial rate fees, are, all of those items are already built into those revenue projections. Um, it's when we look at the month to month, uh, honestly for us, it's very, it puts our minds at ease to see that the revenues have stabilized. And so for the last six months, the revenues have remained constant. And so we have an expectation moving forward that they should remain at that and keep growing as time goes on. Uh, we do have 196,000 in use of money and property. Most of that is the rent that we do receive from GSA. They do rent out the bridge to a CBP building from us. The city does own that facility. And then we have other revenue, which include things like donations and miscellaneous contributions. Um, within the bridge system, uh, we do have one point, almost $1.3 million for personnel, uh, $230,000 for supplies, $200,000 for contracts, $119,000 for other services, $225,000 for capital outlay, $1.5 million for debt service. So last year we did issue some debt uh, related to some bridge projects, so that is the bridge's contributions to that debt. And then transfers out. So we then transfers out, the majority of that does go to the, to the, to the city's general fund, but 300,000 of that does go to the Main Street Fund. And now the Environmental and Solid Waste Fund. We do have the charges for services estimated at 6.8 million. Then the majority of that money does go to personnel, contracts, and capital outlay. Uh, for contracts, we do pay Maverick County a $40 per ton fee for disposing of the trash. So that $1.8 million, most of that does encompass those, that trash disposal fee. And for Capital Alde, we talked about how we've had a backlog. Uh, we've had the money to buy equipment. We haven't been able to get the equipment. I did hear from Public Works that we're, we're making progress. I believe we did receive or we will receive pretty soon some of the trash collection uh, vehicles. That Didn't we get a big truck about. recently? Yes. yes. <laughs> so you know, we've been waiting for that one, I think, a year. The, the trash, the garbage truck, the side loader. It's, yeah. it's, it's been quite a while. And so you know, we're starting to catch up with the things that we've had money to buy, just haven't been able to buy. So that number is inflated a bit, uh, the 2.3 million, just because we're buying what we were supposed to buy the current year and for next year. Uh, we do have a debt service contribution, 400,000. So we are uh, remodeling the uh, public works building. So solid waste, since it is housed out of public works, does pay for some of that cost of the construction. And then transfers out of 326,000, which goes to the city's general fund. On this, I do need to discuss, well, I'd like to discuss and get council's input on the future of the solid waste system because we did discuss how expenses within <coughs> solid waste have gone up over the last several years, especially in the last year due to inflation. Now, moving forward, we do need to consider increasing fees. Uh, when the city first took over this service back in 2007, the transition happened in 2007, 2008, those, that's the fees that were set, $13.50 for city residents and $16.50 uh, for county residents. Again, it's been 15 years and those fees have remained the same while our expenses have continued to grow. 
And so looking at the actual expenditures and what is going, what we project to happen into the future, in order to be prepared to keep up with everything that is necessary, we do need to consider increasing those fees. Now, I am not familiar with the determination on how those original fees were set, but what we did is we wanted, we did a review as to total cost and where we feel is a fair assessment based on city and county residents. So what we're proposing, and it will come to city council as an ordinance in the future. So this ordinance reading doesn't impact those fees. This is just an item to take into consideration. Right. So what we're proposing is to increase city resident fees by a dollar per month and four dollars for county residents. The reason being is that the total cost to operate the, the garbage collection is 5.6 million. That's all inclusive for all the entire service. And so if we did inc increase these fees, that's how much money would be brought in for each segment. There are more city customers. However, the distance having to travel, the fuel, the wear and tear on the vehicles is very, very heavy providing to the county. So that is why the that th these figures come from. Like I said, I'm not sure what the determining factors were for the original set, but we wanted to make sure it was a, at least similar equal type of comp uh, distribution between the two, knowing that a lot of expense is incurred providing the service out in the county. So th that, that will be the recommendation to come up in a future mm -hmm. ordinance, but of course we do want to get council's input, whether now or in the future, as to you know what the feelings are on that. But for our perspective, it is, it's necessary because we do need to be ready for what, what, what we know will happen. The city will continue to grow. We will need more personnel. We will need more equipment to meet the needs of that. I mean, a reality is that inflation is real and it exists and everything goes up, right? But I would like to see maybe compared to other cities, how they do it as far Correct. as the charges for, for these services, maybe yeah, compare. And also, yeah, find out how did they get those rates 15 years ago? Yeah, from my Maybe understanding, we can... from my understanding, so before it was a private company, Waste Management, uh, that, pro that provided those services. Right. And then there was, a, I believe, a proposed increase in fees, and then the city reviewed and said, no, we could probably do it for, for cheaper, and so mm -hmm. we, you know, we decided to pursue it. It's my understanding that those were the fees that that company charged at okay. the time. And so we just kept what was there at the time. Um, but again, it's been 15 years. Right. And so it's, you know, eventually it was gonna catch up to us. I, I, I agree with the mayor on this. Um, I, I also have some concerns on the issue of economic disparity. So unfortunately in our community, the, the poorest residents live in, in the county, some of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so for us to have, and, and I understand that the higher impact, the higher cost, right? Uh, but I'm afraid of what it's going to do to, to our economic disparity within the county uh, to charge some of our clients, that, uh, some of our residents that, um, that might not be able to afford that, right? And, 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 and the issue, I'd, I'd like to perhaps, if possible, see that number come a little bit closer together I think, uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, the, the possibility of things going up, it's inevitable. We're seeing it in every single facet of our lives. But uh, that disparity that I see, that, that $6 disparity, I'd like to, to see if we can narrow that uh, as much as possible. Yes, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a good point to make. You know, it's, it's a constant conversation that we have internally because you know the, the services that the city receives versus what the county residents received honestly is very very similar and you know our county residents do pay county taxes so one of the reasons we've justified that that disparity is that those that live inside the city already pay for these types of services in some shape or form we talked about how taxes do not cover a lot right there's a perception that taxes cover the entire operations of the city and that's just not true but but city residents do pay an additional fee for an additional service. So it's like balancing those two aspects of the, the city's contribution in terms of tax versus you know, the savings that those that out in the county have from not living inside the city while still receiving similar services. But I think the main difference is 
the police versus sheriff protection because they do receive fire protection, they do receive you know, trash services, they do, but they receive the services, it's just who's gonna pay the bill, right? And so again, this is just a proposal. Ultimately, you know, council will determine what those fees are, but any information that you do need, I think that's a good, like a good method is just to compare it to, to others. And so we'll bring that when we do bring that first reading of the ordinance. But I just wanna make just a quick point that this revenue estimate does include those fees, that additional revenue. The distribution ultimately you know, can be determined later, but that's what we feel is necessary in order to sustain this fund. Like I said, it's not, it's not you know, this council, you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault that we're at this situation where we need to increase fees. It's just, it was bound to happen. It just so happened that it's happening now that you know, costs have reached the point where that fee no longer is sustainable. And so you know, we're trying to find a solution that, that works for everybody. Okay. We're not voting on that today, it's just for... Correct, okay. no you're not. Thank you. So now going into the general fund, which is the more lengthy of them. Um, so like we talked, um, the general fund budget is, the revenue budget is $30 million and you'll see property taxes will bring just under six million. So it's nowhere near the, you know, the, the full fund itself. We do expect to receive just over 6.3 million in sales taxes, just over 1 million in franchise taxes, uh, a transfer from the bridge for 12.3 million, ambulance services 1.5, and other revenue 2.8 million. Um, the majority of that does go to personnel. So 19, just over $19 million goes to personnel. Uh, supplies 1.8 million, contracts 3.1, other services 2.1, capital alley 170,000, and transfers out. So that transfers out, again, it's those funds like the library fund, like the streets fund, funds that don't make enough money themselves that need additional money from the general fund. But we're gonna go through the departments and so really quick, but I'm gonna go through them kind of quick, so if you do have any questions, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, so legislative, legislative is of course the city council. The main change here is that we do have included the, the lobbyist fees under contracted services. And under other services and charges, we do have that contribution for public health. Of course, council will still have to determine if and when they want to uh, allocate those funds and, to, and how, but that, that uh, amount is set there. Um, in administration, there really isn't any major changes. And I'm sorry, I'm probably trying to point this out. So I'm just comparing this number to this number here so that you can see uh, what I'm referencing. Um, the main changes here is that emergency management is uh, budgeted under uh, administration. So under materials and supplies, you'll see an increase there. That is because of the subscription for the mass notification system, which actually was an item that's coming up uh, shortly on the agenda. But the main differences are that emergency management is budgeted within administration. Um, in finance, again, there's no major changes uh, except under contract and services. We did talk about the bank fees. So you see that about $50,000 increase under contract and services. In human resources, again, there's no really major changes uh, other than the personnel changes, the, the COVID adjustments. Um, the increases that you do see, uh, we have seen an uptick in hiring, uh, mostly because of our summer programs. We're hiring a lot of part-timers, so HR has incurred a lot of costs associated with background checks and drug testing, things of that nature that have caused some increases there. Uh, economic development, really no major changes. Uh, engineering, same thing, nothing major other than COLA adjustments. Uh, municipal court, there's a modest increase in contracted services, but that has to do with an increase in cost of their maintenance agreements for their system. Uh, city secretary, there is a uh, significant increase in other services and charges, but that happens every other year because next year we have a election that we need to pay for, and it's roughly between 50 and $70,000 to to have an election. <clears throat> Which one, the November? The May election. Oh, that's it. Yes. 
Um, tax office, the largest amount here uh, is under contracted services. That's the contribution, the 224000 That's the contribution that the city provides the appraisal district. Uh, every taxing entity has to contribute to the appraisal district. Uh, planning and building, there's really no uh, major changes there. The police department, let me verify something very quick. Yes, so there is a decrease that you might notice under contracted services. Um, uh, some of you may remember that we had considered a lease program for some of our, for some of our vehicles. And so that was budgeted in the current year, which is this amount, but we decided not to move forward with it. So we're not cutting the police department budget. It's just we never actually went through with what we had planned to do. Previously. I'm sorry, I mean, just hmm? you caught me off guard with a, a, a sending a certain amount of money to the appraisal district. Why if it's the county? That's the way they're set up. Every taxing entity has to contribute a proportional amount to their taxable value. That's how they're funded because they provide the service to each and taxi entity. we still have no say anyway uh, any other decision. I mean, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm concerned because of the values and uh, the property values and everything. I mean, they pretty much are the ones who handle that. Uh, so we still give them by law? By law. By yes. Okay. Yes. We yeah, do that, get someone on, on the board. Yes, there's representation on the board from the city council, but it's proportional to the amount of money you contribute. Right. So I believe the school district has the most amount of members. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. yes. School yeah, district. I believe they have three, right? I think it's three and the, the county has two, maybe? I, I honestly I do not know. I'm not aware. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you no, no, no worries. Yeah, I was like, why? It's a good question. Um, in the fire department, <clears throat> there are some, again, there's some decreases there in the contracted services. But previously, emergency management was budgeted under there and moved into administration. So the overall change there from 222000 to one sixty nine. that's... I, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but uh, I just toured fire station number two. Uh, Councilwoman Cruz and I uh, toured mm -hmm. fire station number two. I do notice that in furniture, it's a very small amount. Has that furniture already been purchased or has that been budgeted somewhere else? So, so the amounts we budget within our budget are the like replacements for things that we do have. Uh -huh. The furniture, basically everything that's part of the entire building, including furniture, is part of the construction cost. Okay. So within the CIP budget, that's where that would come from. So yeah, so anything like in fire station three or one, furniture, new desks would be budgeted within here. Um, sorry, one huh? more point. Uh, so I do notice that our proposed budget for next year is uh, significantly less than the 2021 actual budget, right? So our proposed is 3.6, and what was amended for last year ended up being 5.3. Um, sorry. Yes. The proposed is six point two. Yeah, the proposed is six point two million for for the current. Oh, six point two. Yes. Oh, I'm looking at salary. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it's about a million dollars more than more. the previous year. Okay. Um, traffic control. The number that always stands out on this is under other services and charges. And that is because all of the city's street lights are paid through this department. So we do expect an increase in uh, electricity fees for the city. Right now, the city pays about uh, 3.8 cents per kilowatt. We get a pretty good rate. Uh, but because rates have gone up, we do expect this upcoming year for it to go into the fours. But you know, it's just to show the cost of street lights. I think it's an important thing to highlight that people might not really under expect, but you know, almost $400,000 go to just uh, paying for the power for street lights. Um, and street maintenance, the only major change here is just the COLA adjustments related to the salary increases. In outer shop, again, there is really no major changes. We do have some equipment, some vehicles that they are replacing, some service vehicles. So you do see that $70,000 in capital outlay. For 
Parks and Recreation, once again, um, for, for traffic and for Parks and Rec, they're the ones who have the most utilities because of all of the lighting in the parks. So you see that modest increase, about $46,000. That is also because of the utility uh, cost, uh, utilities. And then the last department within the general fund is facilities. And so within this, the largest increase here is in contracted services. So we do have the, um, the contract for the Christmas lights that did see a, a small increase. Um, we are budgeting for additional custodians, but, it, but contracted services, because there are certain cases where we don't need an employee, but we need somebody to come in after hours. So just to be able to fund contracted custodians. And then they have a backflow prevention. So that uh, $200,000 increase there is those three things combined. Um, some other items that we did want to highlight, just so the council is aware. So insurance. The city has general liability insurance, law enforcement insurance, Arizona omission insurance, you know, basically the full fledge of insurance is to protect the city against losses. And so the expected cost of that is $412,000 uh, for the upcoming year. For IT, uh, $607,000. Um, just over 330,000 are for the management fee. We do outsource this, but the other 270,000 are for equipment, uh, new hardware, new software, things that uh, are needed within the departments. Uh, legal services, we typically budget 255,000. Uh, legal works under a retainer of 75,000 a year that covers the basic services, but every time there's an additional service that's outside of that scope, we get billed per hour for that. So it does average between 200 and 275,000 per year. Um, and then golf course. So golf course, we pay a management fee of 75,000 per year. Then we have to pay for the cost of operations, all the equipment, the manpower, all of that. The, we pay 75,000 just I for the management the, alone. The, the managers or the, I mean, the company that was taking care of the golf course should do that, not us. Is there? Uh, I'm sorry, in terms of the personnel or for the? For the personnel and the maintenance as well. Well, so we hire them to manage. The contract is for them to manage. So we pay them 75,000 per year as a management fee. Then we have to reimburse them for their actual expenses in, act in doing the operations. So the cost to the city is 433,000. Uh, 75 of that goes straight just to the management fee for the company. And then maybe we can talk about this more privately, but I mean, do you really honestly see a difference when we change from us taking care of it as a city and changing to having a company, a private company taking care of it? Because I haven't, I mean, I don't know if it's really worth it or not. Yeah, I, I'm uh, not a golfer, but no, I don't really know <laughs> anything about golf. But uh, financially, the issue that we had before was that we were making no income. We were billing, you know, with the, the, the management was under an association and we had an agreement that we would bill, right, so much per month. I believe it was a few thousand dollars per month. The issue was is that we were collecting nothing. And so we are now making money because now we get the green fees, you know, we get the sale of the, you know, the concession stands the alcohol, you know, all of that is now money that comes in. So in terms of now it's bringing in money, that's a positive. Do we the know operations how much, that's how much it's brought in? Uh, we can get you a detailed yeah. report that the issue is, is that the, uh, the money for the beer sales uh, does go to the Friends of Eagle Pass, which is not the city. Uh, we see it as a net positive because the Friends of Eagle Pass then contributes uh, to the city or the city's efforts, but it's not necessarily you know, fair comparison. So we can prepare that for the next. I'd still like to see how much money goes to the friends. Of oh yes, yeah. yeah. We'll make sure we include that. Yeah. Uh, but we'll so prepare. So you're that saying there, there has been a, pro it's been profitable the way it's been managed. Well, right now. the golf course will probably profitable. never be well, profitable. Well, not profitable, but, it's but not, now we're not having to pay out as much. City like we used yeah. to. Yeah. Correct. Correct. I don't yes. think it's ever going to be profitable. It is to provide it's recreation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, we have both schools, students that go and play golf, and it's, it's an option. The, the Friends of Eagle Pass, is that a separate um, 
who manages that fund? It's a 501, right? It's a 501c3, yes. but who manages it? So the board is made out of employees. It is myself, Mr. Morua, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, Ms. Castaño, and Mr. Marquez. Um, so, but it is a completely separate board from the city. Um, Jesse, now that we're, we've got the topic, um, the IT, how is that working out? Because I know that, I mean, at least I had my reservations about, you know, moving on yes. with another company and so just an update. I know we were having a hard time at yeah. the beginning, we were never able to get connected. I just want to know that we're, yes. that it, we've, we're good now or what is, where are we at with IT? You want it? I'll defer to you. Yes, uh, actually we've been doing major projects with IT. Mm -hmm. uh, one of it is moving on transition to the 365 email. Uh, so we've been investing heavily, as you can see, every budget we've been, we've been adding funding to, to the IT. Mm -hmm. And just because we want to be as safe as possible. Uh, overall, we, I do believe, and this, is my, this is my opinion, I do believe that, that we have a very good IT company. Uh, they're also helping us now move on the transition of GIS, which we definitely feel is needed for, for the city. Of course, it's not perfect. Of course, mm -hmm. we get our, our concerns, complaints from, from the department heads uh, on, on some items, it's mainly communication, but overall, the performance has been good and the service provided has been good. So definitely we had to compare to the one we had and we're in good hands right now. Is that what you Based on my, um, my opinion, yes, ma'am. Well, we don't want it based on your opinion. We want it based on facts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's okay. no, everyone no, has, a, has their own opinion and their, right. own, I understand. their own interactions with the, with the company. But based overall, if I can make an evaluation overall for all the directors, uh -huh. I say it's good. Okay. good. Thank you. Yes. So the last uh, major fund that we do have is the debt service fund. Uh, so I'm going to start with the bottom part of the expenditures. So the total payments for debt that the city does have to make in the upcoming year are just over 7.2 million. So where does that money come from? Well, just under 4 million of that does come from property taxes. But other funds who have projects that benefit for them do pay for debt. So the ICT will contribute 46,000. The Storm Drainage Fund will contribute 382,000. The general fund will pay for 779,000. The bridge system will pay for the 1.5 million, and solid waste will pay for 400,000. So that's how we will pay for uh, the debt payments that are coming up in the next year. Okay. And now the fun part. This is my favorite part. <laughs> so CIP, and it's just one sheet on your. If you have, everyone does have your presentation here. Right? So if you turn to the last page. So by charter, the city does have to adopt annually an update to our CIP. And CIP, like I mentioned before, you know, it's where ideas become reality. It is a long-term plan. And I think, it, you know, working in government, you know, sometimes we get frustrated by how long things take sometimes. But, you know, unfortunately it does take time to, from, you know, thinking about a project to actually seeing it done. Uh, because we want to make sure we do it right, it gets financed the right way. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but this list, the list that get council approves is going to be very important for us moving forward. Because this list provides a roadblock, uh, a roadmap for, um, for my department, for the for grants division, to really understand what are the goals of council of the city and where should we look at allocating our resources moving forward. And so... The, the process that we have in place is that departments looking five years out, sometimes even 10 years out, have to talk to us, sit down with us and say, hey, these are my expectations moving forward. This is what I think I'm gonna need. These are things that I think are gonna need to be replaced, major items. They do have to be over $100,000 in value. They do have to last more than 10 years. Um, so we're talking about big investments that the city is going to make. Um, so, the process is the department submit the, the, the projects, a committee is formed, then a ranking is done. The ranking is based on it, the project's uh, contribution to public, self, uh, public health and safety, uh, infrastructure needs, the extent of benefit, basically the percentage of the population that will benefit from it, the future financial cost, and the impact to quality of life. So here you have the list 
that was uh, prepared by the committee uh, for this upcoming year's CIP. That doesn't mean that these projects are going to get addressed in the upcoming year, but it means that we're going to move forward with planning for these projects. And so number one and number two have been number one and number two for the last several <laughs> years. It's streets and sidewalks, right? That's basically the basic foundational things that we know we're going to have to deal with every single year. Um, number three on the list is something that is, wasn't there before, and it's a study for the main Arroyo, the main Arroyo system. So well, the main Arroyo system has been there for, you know, for decades. And we do need to start talking about the plan to replace, to repair, you know, what are we gonna do? What's the overall plan with this? I know Mr. Sandoval is very familiar with that there have been studies done years in the past that have completely, I guess, redone the way we look at the main Arroyo. We've talked about other avenues to get straight to the river rather than coming down the entire city. So there really needs to be a big picture look at to, this is not really a five-year plan. This is probably more of a 10-year plan as to where is the city going? What's, what are we looking at the capacity for this? And do we need to explore other avenues to create better drainage within the city? And so the, the committee did feel that that's probably the city's number one priority is to at least start the study to figure out where we need to be in the next several years. Um, that's followed by another drainage issue with the storm, storm drainage improvements. As council is aware, the city does have a drainage master plan. We did borrow money to start addressing a lot of those projects. We will get more than half of those projects done with the funding that we have. However, there will still be some left over that won't get addressed. We don't have the funding for it. So we want to make sure that that stays on the list to make sure that all of those identified issues are addressed. Um, <coughs> number five on the list is the completion of Patsy Wynn Boulevard, a project we've been talking about that it looks like it's moving forward, so we're, we're really excited about that project. But of course, it still needs to be funded. So it's, it, it is on the list. Um, truck route reconstruction in the, the industrial park. So the industrial park, uh, just off of uh, Public Works, behind Public Works, um, that road, I don't know if any of you have driven through it, is in need of some TLC. You know? <laughs> so it, you know, it, it, the problem with that is because it is very heavily traffic, well, traffic by very heavy vehicles at that too. Um, it does need to be relooked at and you know, reconstructed in well, order taking to. Taking advantage of that comment, I, I strongly suggest that uh, from now on, maybe a suggestion for planning and zoning and, uh, and public works, uh, start building the roads for industrial or com heavy commercial traffic instead of asphalt to do them uh, out of concrete. Mm -hmm. Because later on, and that's the same, uh, you know, that's my, my worries also with the one that we're gonna discuss in executive session. I mean, we keep going back and, and then the city is responsible and then in the end, after many years, fixing it over and over again, we're gonna end up spending more. So maybe just, you know, have a clause there that as long as it's industrial or commercial or heavy traffic use, to make it out of concrete so that we can just probably Yes. Uh, you know, safe in the yes. in the long run. And I believe that those are in talks already. We are working on bringing a proposal for new grading requirements. Um, City engineer Mr. McGee has really helped with this idea, and we're working with our bureau, our contracted engineers. So we are bringing that soon oh, that's uh, great. for council's review, and that would be different design based on if it's residential, it would be one set of design. If it's industrial, they shouldn't all be the same. So we, we are gonna be bringing something like that. Oh, that's great person. news, that's Thank great you. news. Thank you. So the next item on the list is bridge lighting improvements. And this is really more of a safety uh, component. Um, there are some lighting issues that do need to be addressed, but there's under lighting that needs to be addressed as well, especially as the immigrant issue becomes you know, more prevalent. For safety and you know for visibility, you know, under there is no lighting under those bridges. So to, to add lighting, um, the next item is an animal shelter. Um, Public works, you know, will be remodeled, reconstructed. Um, however, the plan is not to keep the animal uh, the vector control offices there. Uh, you know, they are under the police department. Hopefully, somewhere closer. That's still to be determined. Location, you know, what it's going to look like, what service will be provided. 
but we wanted to make sure it's on the list because it'll be in need pretty soon. Yes. Um, are, are, are we partnering with any community or organizations on that? Or we've talked about it. Dealers? Yeah, we've talked about it, but um, there's nothing formal. Uh, but it's something that we will be pursuing. Yeah, it, you know, when we talk about these projects, and one of the items that we've talked about is a lot of the, the stakeholder meetings, you know, to be able to get their input mm -hmm. into, uh, you know, we, we want input, but we also want help. You know, it's not, you know, you know, we're a community, and so we want the community to be part of these projects, not just with the ideas, but also on getting, you know, the issues resolved. And so that's part of what, what those discussions are for a lot of these projects, not just the, the animal shelter. Um, then we have the construction of Fire Station 4. Once again, we have, we've narrowed it down to two locations, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're gonna talk about how moving forward with things in the short term. That's one of those projects that honestly, within the next month or so, with let's say two months, we do plan on going out for design uh, because we wanna make sure we have that ready so that as soon as funding becomes available, we can start construction on because we know that that's gonna be in need very, very soon. Um, the next item is remodeling the city hall. You can see the note there, it was re-added to the list. So it had made it and then it got <laughs> kicked off. Um, so we do need to add it back to the list. Um, the bridge system toll booth renovations. So we're doing a lot of improvements for the hardware, the, the software at the bridge, but the actual booths themselves have not been included. The thought was, well, if we're really gonna do a massive overhaul with all of the hardware uh, and software, it's probably the best time to redo the booths as well. So we don't have, you know, the work done at the same time is more efficient. Uh, park improvements. So park improvements is really, we include that as a general item. Uh, we always will have a need for more parks, more recreation, you know, more things for people to do. We leave it as a general item because we wanna make sure that we allocate funding to it. Ultimately, what is done to what park and what it looks like, that's you know, for Parks and Rec and City Council to decide, but we leave it as a placeholder for, to make sure we provide funding for that. We have the remodeling of the DPS building. Um, it should be a formally turned over to the city very, very soon. Uh, we do have an item to discuss the use of that uh, in the meeting, but we do need to look at some remodeling to that building. Remodeling the station number three, we did talk about how that used to be the administrative building. Now there's need for more dormitory, dormitory and more lounge space for the firefighters. So we do need to make some remodeling there. Um, bridge system digital signage. So with this list, we often think, you know, these are things that we're investing in, but there's very little actual monetary return. This is one of those items that we like having on the list because there's a potential of not only advertising what we need to advertise, it's also for businesses to be able to advertise. And so that's one of the items that we, you know, we like because it'll hopefully bring in <laughs> some, some income. Um, we have the fire training tower, again, an item that's been there <laughs> for years. Um, unfortunately, it keeps on falling down, but we do feel that with with our financial standing and where we are looking for, look, looking towards, that we'll actually be able to address this one pretty soon. Um, rec Center and Auditorium, the council just approved the, the feasibility study. Uh, are they working on it? Already? We have a kickoff on Friday, a kickoff meeting on Friday, I believe, okay. yes. Um, then we have animal control and code enforcement offices. So at the public safety headquarters, the police department, the old firing range, uh, that was not remodeled. The idea was that the city would come back and remodel that area for animal control offices and code enforcement offices. So we still have that to address. Then we get into the river walk reconstruction. So those of you who have had a chance to look at the draft of the, uh, the Main Street Master Plan, um, that's one of the components. There's several components on this list, but that's, that's the highest ranking of those. Um, I think it's a comment that I've heard, I think since I first started with the city, is how nice it would be to bring that back to life. Um, so that is one of the items that we hope to address as well. New recycling facility. Again, we're doing public works, but that recycling building is not included as part of that. So we would like to do some updates there. The domestic violence shelter. So we did talk about the grant funding that we were hoping to pursue. Unfortunately, that did not come through. So that needs to be on our, our CIP list. Uh, did, we, did we get a report back 
on how that grant did, uh, any areas of weaknesses or areas of improvement that, that, that we need to focus on? Because uh, I'd like to pursue, uh, pursue that again. Um, and I mean, obviously, I, I, I think it's, it's hard to prioritize any of these on the list. Oh, right? they, they're all important. Uh, but this one is of particular importance to me. Uh, so uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're, we're aggressively pursuing this and whatever I can do on my end, uh, whether it's through writing or, 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 or reaching out to contacts, um, you know, I want to make sure that this comes to fruition. But, but if I can get that back from, from grants, the, the report on where our deficiencies were in the application and, and kind of what, what could have done. Better. Yes, and this funding, um, the source of this funding was a COVID-related type funding. And the areas where we scored poorly were on shovel ready um, because they wanted the city to own the property, to have the building designed already. So those are things that were kind of out of our control because you know it just was too late in the game to have all those things ready. And so that's part of why we, um, why we want to make sure that we start designing the fire station number four because of the, the grant possibilities. Maybe we a do, dumb do. question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can we use, I mean, because I like the red doors. I, I think everyone <laughs> does, and it's just something that it just, uh, it, it's nice. So is there a way that maybe we can use, or a possibility that we can use the same design? I mean, if it was already designed in order to, I mean, accordingly mm -hmm. to our needs, if it works, can we use the same design? We just, you know, pretty much change depending on the on the lot or the property that we we construct it or we build it, we just get the engineering. Uh, I, I think the th general, That's the only thing that really changes. I'll the defer to Mr. Part. McGee, but I'll, uh, but I But maybe, assume. I mean, it's just something, I mean, it's just uh, because we can actually save a lot of money because they don't charge us for the design and the plans and everything all over again. Right. So it's just something, it's just like the contractors, you, you use the same floor plan, it just, uh, you know, <laughs> spend a thousand dollars on the on the engineering uh, plan, and that's it. So maybe just, I mean, just to consider, maybe it's a possibility. Uh, I know that depending on the location, we might need extra rooms or not, and then we can just add to it. But it's just, it's just yeah. a recommendation. It's a very similar thing that we're doing to the gymnasium with the boys, formerly Boys and Girls right. Club. You know, we want the same general idea. Uh, you know, the floor plan. But however, there still needs to be, because it is a different site, I'm sure geotechnical, things like that, they need to be reviewed. Yeah, because the floor plan can be used, but not the, the engineering mm -hmm. part. But I mean, again, it, it's just- Yeah, it's an, yeah. it's an yeah, option. It's an option. And I think it's nice if our, you know, there's, you know, similarities. And there's similarity, between, yeah. exactly. It, it's their similarity mm -hmm. to, to each building. Speaking of that project, it's not on here? Because it's already funded. It's from, okay. So these are all <laughs> things that need funding. Yes. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, and exactly so. What you're, what you're saying, it's exactly what we're going to do with that Cruz Majones. Save a lot of money. Yes. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a, this is a long list, but there's a long list of projects that are already funded that are in the works. Right. So, you know, this is just what we want to accomplish in the next five years. Okay. Uh, where did we leave off? Um, of the partnership to enhance Maverick County Airport. So we do know that Maverick County is doing, you know, is taking the bull by the horns on doing some improvements, getting some funding. But we've long talked about, you know, what, what partnerships can we do? That's really, again, a placeholder because there's nothing set in stone, this is what we're gonna do. But it's just to have that, to know that, hey, we need to set aside some money because we may need to contribute to this. Um, virtual shooting range. So the police department did have a demonstration, I believe, Councilwoman Cruz attended one, right? Um, so it is a pricey item. We need but, it. <laughs> but it is a valuable tool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so that's on there. We have the downtown plaza. So again, the Main Street Master Plan uh, does have this. The green space? The green space. Mm -hmm. Speaking sure. about the, the police uh, program and everything, are we still on with, uh, with the money that it was put aside for the remodeling and accommodation of the annex building for, for them to practice and Oh, so that's what I, I think is being referred to as for code enforcement, to turn that into office space. 
like the the, the, the shooting ring. The the shooting ring. Oh, so that's the one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I apologize. Okay. I thought it was an open range or something extra. Then we have the parking garage downtown. So that's one of the items that we've been discussing a lot internally um, because we do need to look at parking overall. You know, we know what the master plan says is that unfortunately people in our community have said that they, one of the main barriers that they have is access to parking downtown, right? So we wanna make sure we address that. Now, long term, we do need to look at a parking garage, but in the short term, we may look at a, just a ground level, regular parking lot to, to address that. Um, those will need to be reviewed professionally to determine parking, traffic, all of those issues uh, downtown. But we'll discuss that more in detail as we get to the, through the master plan itself. Um, then we have um, carports uh, for police uh, at the public safety headquarters for the units there. And then we have the item at the very bottom, which is the construction of fire station number five. The, the reason that's at the bottom, not to say that it's not important to look at, it's that there's still a lot of review that needs to be done. You know, with fire station number four, we have the general area, we have the land, we, we know that that's gonna move pretty soon. Since this is a five year plan, we wanna make sure we're looking at it, but you know, it still has the longest way to go from all the other projects. So that's basically the, the committee's recommendation on the projects for CIP. We, the council can add projects, remove projects, move projects around mm -hmm. as you see fit. Uh, we don't have to do that today. You know, that can be done at the next reading or it could be adopted as is and it could be adopted, uh, changed any time after that. Mm -hmm. So this is not set in stone by any means, but just to give you a review as to what we're looking at internally uh, for the next budget. It seems like an accurate list that also order but we still have until next meeting right correct to make the even meeting. after even even after, after. okay yes. <laughs> that looks good okay. yeah so that can a lot of our... great projects that would benefit our community mm -hmm. yes definitely and like i said the the grant side of it is really important because we want to make sure we have a plan so that when these are when the funding opportunities become available we're ready to apply and we're more likely to get them but that concludes the presentation, and hopefully we'll have the last and final reading on, on Tuesday. Right. So uh, I need act. We need action. So do I have a motion to to approve? Uh, we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Ramon. No second. Second by Councilwoman Cruz. Discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Item 13, second reading of an ordinance levying a tax rate for the City of Eagle Pass for the tax rate 2022, finding that the meeting at which this ordinance is passed is open to the public as required by law, providing a severability clause and establishing an effective date. Second reading, there's no changes, so recommend to approve. I'll Thanks. make a motion. We have a motion to approve by Councilman Diaz and a second by Mayor Pro Tem Ramon. Discussion, all in favor, unanimous. Item 14, consideration and possible approval of a resolution appointing members to the Mayor's Youth Council of the City of Eagle Pass. I do have some additional names, but I was gonna ask if we could still uh, table this item until next Tuesday. I make a motion to table. We have a motion to table by Mayor Pro Tem Ramon. No second. A second by Councilwoman Cruz. Discussion, all in favor, unanimous. 15, consideration and possible approval of a resolution appointing members to the City of Eagle Pass Mayor's Fitness Council. Same, Same. request if possible. And motion to... Um... A second. Thank you. We have a motion to table by Mayor Pro Tem Ramon and a second by Councilman Diaz. Discussion, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Appreciate it. Item 16, discussion and possible action on business improvement grant pilot program. Mr. Marquez, how are you doing, sir? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good Mr. Marquez, Economic Development Department. Uh, so what Ms. Alislao is gonna be handing out to you is going to be a project that we've been working on, a program that we've been working on. Uh, so tonight it's gonna be a bit, little bit different. Um, I wanted to introduce you guys to Ms. Adi Mendoza. Uh, Ms. Adi Mendoza runs the Business Retention and Expansion Program. Essentially what that is is that uh, we not only want to attract new businesses to Eagle Pass, but we also wanna make sure that the ones that are here are able to grow. 
uh, one of the requests that we had from City Council in some previous meetings is that the expansion of the facade program in the downtown be available to other members uh, or other businesses within the city. So what Ms. Adi is going to present to you guys today is uh, an item that we are calling the Business uh, Improvement Grant. Um, so uh, essentially what you guys have adopted or will adopt within the budget is an allocation of $100,000 to go towards this pilot program. So I'm going to let her uh, go through what this program entails, how it's going to work, and essentially how it's going to help our community. So, Ms. Adi Mendes. So a little bit about the program. Um, the City of Eagle Pass uh, Business Improvement Grant Program's objective is to help businesses located in certain commercial areas of the City of Eagle Pass improve their facade, um, their landscaping, be able to acquire restaurant equipment, and uh, some licenses that they might need. Also, this pilot program will have a pool of $100,000, and it'll be available to qualifying businesses on a first-come, first-served basis. It, it is a match grant. It's a dollar per dollar. And what is the maximum that one can get? Uh, 10,000. Okay. 10,000 would be the maximum. Oh, and there it is. It is. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm saying there it is, sorry. <laughs> it is divided into four <laughs> different categories. Uh, the first category is the facade grant improvement. This one is a dollar per dollar, up to $10,000, and it includes exterior paint or any renovations that they may want to make to the exterior. Uh, the second category is a property or infrastructure improvement. It's also a dollar per dollar, up to $10,000. Uh, qualifying projects include parking lot resurfacing, striping, driveway improvement, lighting, and streetscape. The third category is landscape improvement. And this one is for like uh, beautification of the business, uh, putting trees, uh, shrubs, um, and grass. Um, the fourth one is restaurant equipment, licenses, and permits. This one is also a dollar per dollar for restaurant equipment, such as grease trap, uh, hood, or commercial oven. Uh, we've noticed through the business visits that a lot of restaurants sometimes have uh, issues acquiring uh, uh, their licenses, such as a TVC or being able to buy restaurant equipment. So this is going to help them. Um, it's also a dollar per dollar, like I mentioned, up to $10,000. So some of the ineligible projects um, include retroactive projects. That means that they'll have to submit an application before they start working on whatever it is that they're trying to do, whether it's landscaping or uh, facade or any renovations. Uh, fast food restaurants also don't uh, qualify. Uh, secondhand stores are also ineligible projects. And uh, projects submitted by applicants outside of the designated business improvement area. I will go into a little more detail about which are the designated areas that we have. So the designated areas are on the map. I know you can barely make out what it is, but um, it, the first area is in Del Rio Boulevard. It does start uh, in the intersection of 2nd Street, uh, right <coughs> by where the home cake, homemade cakes used to be. Oh, yes. And it goes all the way up to the intersection of Veterans and Del Rio Boulevard a little bit before you get to Banquito Las Minas. Okay. The other area is on El Indio Highway, and it starts on Lane 9500. 9, it's around where the Moonlight Ballroom is right now, and it ends uh, a little bit before the intersection of El Indio Highway and Bibb Street. <coughs> Probably the question that everyone will ask, how did we get to those areas only? to um, those areas. So through the visits, uh, we've noticed that most of the businesses that need assistance are located in those, in those areas. two areas, especially when it comes to uh, beautification and landscaping. Do you have any additional questions? I do, oh, go ahead. So I, I know that we've been uh, exploring different options, particularly mm -hmm. in the restaurant industry. Are these, and, and when I'm looking at ineligible types, uh, for example, if a, if a food truck was located in, the, in one of these areas, would they be eligible for this type of funding? At the moment, we do have a restriction in our guidelines, and that's mainly for- um, Brick and mortar. For brick and mortar, and it does have, um, on there it does say that it has to have a certain amount of square footage for the seating area. 
So uh, we do have some, some guidelines that we'll be providing with the applications once this becomes available. We've never done this before, right? No, it's a pilot program. Yeah, and it used to be just for downtown, mm -hmm. so we're expanding. Yes, it, so we're, we're, approved. we're trying to see how it all works out. Um, you do have a list of uh, different grants. It mm -hmm. says 10000 for um, improvement, another 10000 for infrastructure improvement, and then landscaping. Can some, one, one business apply for all of them, or is it just one no, per just one. business? Um, the guidelines, I believe they can, but they would have to submit like different applications. I would have to go back and double okay. check. But you cannot get more than 10000 no, that is, that's so the maximum. So 10,000 is the max. 10,000 10, is, is the maximum. Max. So then they wouldn't be able to apply for... No, and, and then right now we do have a cap of 100,000. So we want to help us manage as, as many possible. as we, we can, right? Impact. Any idea on the time frame uh, from when they apply to getting the... the it would all depend. Uh, I do have on there that they have to submit all the paperwork within uh, 30 days. That way the process is a little bit faster. Okay. I just want to clarify that, that question. So technically they could apply, let's say, for uh, kitchen equipment and landscape. Uh, essentially, they, they could submit all it into one application, but the maximum amount that we can grant would just be 10 grand. So, um, I mean, it's not necessarily that we're going to pick and choose. It's just the, the maximum amount that they're going to be reimbursed will be up to $10,000. So, yes, they can apply for multiple ones. I like this very much because it's not just the facade, right? Usually, I think it was uh, we help with the facade. This includes landscaping, resurfacing, yes. I mean, just beautification. So I, I like the idea. I love the, the fact that restaurants can even apply for TBC license and yes. get reimbursed for that. So Yes, and, uh, very good. Like, any questions? Additional questions? Excellent work. Thank you. I don't have questions, just comments that I think this is going to be something great because it expands also to a lot of more people are going to have the option to apply for this. Yes. The only thing I think it's going to be so successful that we're going <laughs> to run out of money pretty quick. That. That's going to be a good problem to have. But, but thank you so much for everything that you do. And you. This, this sounds like it's going to be a successful program. Mr. Marquez, uh, do we still have any funds available from USDA for the business still? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, for the loans themselves, yeah, we definitely have a, a variety of programs available for businesses, small businesses. Uh, the revolving loan fund that you're referring to, we still have uh, roughly about uh, $400,000 available. Um, so again, anybody that's listening um, and you're looking for, you know, starting capital to start your own business or perhaps maybe start a food truck, which this one may not necessarily fit that, but we do have other programs available. If anybody's listening that is, is looking to, to, to gain, uh, not to gain, but to get uh, finance for a project, uh, please reach out to us, so the Economic Development Department. At what number, just the 1111? Yeah, 773 uh, 11 uh, just asked to be transferred to the Economic Development Department. Thank, thank, you. You. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for the presentation. If I may. Yes, I please. I do want to announce uh, that uh, as you see, Ms. Ms. Edisla was presenting now because she was just promoted to Assistant Economic Development Director. So you're going to be seeing a lot more of her. Uh, she's been doing a great job on economic development, so we, we gave her the opportunity to be promoted to, to assist. Awesome. Congratulations. 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 That's going to be a, a good one-two punch, so thank you. Congrats. Do we I'll entertain a motion to approve this pilot program. I'll make a motion. We have a motion to approve by Councilman Diaz and a second by Councilwoman Cruz. Discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Item 17, discussion and possible action on an emergency management citizen notification system. So uh, I was going to discuss the uh, hyperreach as a program, and I think you may have it in your, mm -hmm. yes. your paperwork. Um, emergency mass notification system. 
for the city of Eagle Pass. Uh, some of you may recall that in uh, years past, we had uh, a different program uh, that it was not very successful. We didn't have a lot of uh, community members that um, elected to uh, utilize the system. And it wasn't being used to its full potential um, by the public or by, uh, by us as a, as a city. Uh, this particular program that, that you're looking at here is um, is a way to notify the citizens um, during emergencies. But in, in addition to that, it is a lot, or it is user friendly. The the biggest purpose, obviously, is for notifications during emergencies. Um, when we if we were to utilize the system within the city, the, the, the benefit of it is that uh, not only would it be utilized by the emergency management, but every department within the city can utilize it, whether it's in-house or to issue notifications to the public, such as, for example, uh, public works could issue uh, street closures or uh, uh, cleanup campaigns, uh, things of that nature. Um, other departments can use it to notify citizens of upcoming events. Like we could have used it today. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, in addition to that, and I'm not going to go through the, the whole um, PowerPoint here because I'm going to lose touch in what I'm trying to get across. Um, but it allows us to create those messages, be able to notify our citizens. Um, if we issue a notification, they will receive it on their cell phones if and when they have opted in. Uh, within a few seconds. Uh, the other uh, benefit of this particular program that is different from what we had in the past is that we can utilize it in iPods. Um, notifications uh, such as what you were receiving today from the state of Texas, the National Weather Service. So anybody, uh, when it becomes life-threatening, we are able to use this. It goes to FEMA and the notification will be sent out to people who, even if they haven't registered their phone into the program, they'll still receive the message from Maverick County. So let's say, uh, as an example, we were to have a hazardous material spill somewhere along the rail line. Um, we can come into this program, set a radius, uh, let's say if we're gonna evacuate for a mile radius. We can send uh, that notification to the people that are within that mile, regardless of registration and they would receive that notification to either stay out of the area or to evacuate or to shelter in place, whatever uh, the decision is that we would reach at that point. Um, but like I said, I like the fact that we can use it not only for emergencies, but we can use it in-house to be able to notify citizens of whatever it is that may be coming up. The departments can also use it to uh, recall personnel, uh, for example, the fire department can recall a swift water rescue team for today, uh, and it'll go straight to their phones. The police department can issue a recall to the special response team, and it'll go straight to their phones without having to make those you know, phone calls and text messages. You type in your message, uh, send it out, and everybody receives it. Um, this particular company, HyperReach, uh, is also uh, willing to not only uh, train uh, the personnel virtually, but they're willing to come down and train locally. Um, every department would have a certain section or criteria that they would have to meet, and they can set their own um, parameters, per se. So that's also a plus. The, and lastly, this uh, particular program uh, would be well, it's already in the budget, if you all were to approve it. And uh, if we do go through with it, it would be a three month, or I'm sorry, a three year commitment. And then we would have to fund it every year if we feel that it's working out for us. Um, it is going to take us as, as a city to promote it as much as possible. Uh, Hyperreach will do their part in promotion also and signing people up. Um, but it is going to take all of us to, to make it work and have people buy into this system. This is the only real way that we're going to be able to notify the vast majority of our citizens uh, when there is um, a, you know, an emergency in our community. Um, there will still be people that 
do not have cell phones uh, or do not even have landlines and do not use the internet. So um, it's not going to be 100% obviously, uh, but we will be able to reach the vast majority of, uh, of our citizens utilizing a system such as this. And are the messages sent both in English and Spanish? Yes. Both, uh, both languages or whatever languages we choose, they do send them by text message, email, and an actual phone call, automated phone call. Nice. And, and people would have to do something to opt in to receive the messages. Yes, we would assist uh, in registration. It's, it's very simple. Um, people, it, it's an actual app on your phone uh, okay. that, they can, that they can utilize or download on their phones. And registration is simple, and uh, we would go from there, of course. We would have to have um, um, the ability to assist people who may not know or may not want to or have the capability to register at home. We would have to have you know, some, some sort of assistance to be able to provide to, to register people. Uh, we did in the past. With the previous uh, system, we would sit outside HEB in Walmart and we would ask people if they wanted to join and we would you know, register them ourselves. So there has to be campaigns like that that, that, uh, that would improve the, the usage of a system like this. We can, we can partner with local organizations. I'm sure organizations like Rotary or Absolutely. the Lions Club, uh, Lady Lions might uh, wanna assist us with you know, similar things like that, like just, just being at HEB or even hosting a big community event, um, you know, I, I can ask Lever County Hospital District to partner up as well. Absolutely. And um, like I said, this would be also interconnected into our um, social media sites. So any message that we would to issue out in the system would automatically go into our social media sites within the city. So right now, that's all we have is social media. Um, to be able to warn uh, our citizens, and I think we need to improve on that, uh, utilizing a system like that. So uh, right now, that's my recommendation. Like I said, if we start running into some issues, uh, we can always look for another type of... Uh, uh, what is the, the cost? Right now, for um, a community our size would be 7000 a year for, for uh, a three-year okay. commitment. That's reasonable. Yes. And then the county is also looking into this same system, uh, where they stand as far as uh, moving forward with it, I'm not sure. But I know that once they do come into an agreement or if they do decide to use a, utilize the same system, uh, we can integrate to where there's only one and there's only one message being sent out regardless of location of uh, the citizen. Uh, and they would just you know, pay their, their portion based on their population. Yeah, we can uh, look into the mobile uh, providers, maybe, if they can actually do us a favor of sending each one that owns a cell phone the option via text of actually accepting or not, you know, to, to actually connect to it. Yes, ma'am. It will be the easiest way. <coughs> it sounds like a, like a good thing for the community to be able to reach more people. Not everybody has Facebook social media, Instagram. That's correct, and, and you know, and even with social media, it does still take, you know, some time for us to be able to yeah. prepare a message. Um, you know, I'll use this morning as an example. Uh, the storm that we got was not supposed to happen and it wasn't um, anticipated. Right. Um, so by the time that we issue, you know, a warning through our social media sites, we already lost about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And this would improve this that. Similar to like an Amber Alert, right? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. So to use iPods or, or that particular version, um, it does have to be life threatening. We can't utilize that for you know regular notifications to people that are not registered. However, you know any impending storm that is life threatening, it would qualify, uh, such as tornadoes or wildfire or hazardous material spill, things like that. Active shooters, things of that nature. So that can be, those uh, cases can be actually managed directly with hyper, I mean, hyper reach can actually take care of that. That it's yes. automatic regardless mm -hmm. you have the authority, I mean, authorization or not from the citizen. That's correct. Uh, okay. 
That's correct. Uh, they they go straight through FEMA and uh, issue that that warning. Yeah, they, we don't have to do anything. We just have to make the request of what we want ordered. Aye. So moved. Oh, so do we have Second. a motion to approve? By, yes. We I have a motion. Second. To. Uh, Approve the system by Councilwoman Cruz and a second by Mayor Putin Ramon. Discussion? Just, just, if I may interrupt, the motion will be to authorize the city manager to execute. To authorize, yes. Yes, ma'am. City manager to execute and approve. So we have a motion, a second. Discussion, all in favor? Unanimous. Yes. Thank you. 18, discussion and possible action on designating the former Texas Department of Public Safety building parentheses 32 Foster Maldonado Boulevard as the emergency management operations. Uh, so on that also, um, for years now, we haven't had a facility or the infrastructure for emergency management. Um, I think that was um, very notable during COVID. Uh, we started out here at City Hall, the conference room as uh, the pandemic got larger and the personnel that we were bringing into work expanded, we needed to move on. Fortunately, at that time, uh, we were able to util utilize the public library since the employees and the library was not open. Uh, we grew out of that one and we ended up moving to the county facility or the county UC uh, at the 12 miles out. And that's uh, where we operated for almost two years. Um, for that particular event, the pandemic itself, I think that the facility out there at the 12 miles uh, on Highway 131 was adequate because we were isolated based on the emergency that we were dealing with. However, a lot of the emergencies that we uh, have dealt with in the past and will deal with in the future, such as storms and flooding, um, we need to be closer to town. And we need a facility where we can um, have the infrastructure and the technology to be able to manage emergency management incidents. Uh, and I feel that, uh, that that facility, since it's been donated, uh, would, would meet our, our needs. Um, of course, it would need some, some modifications uh, to fit what, what uh, is required of an EOC, but uh, uh, such as generators and you know the remodeling of, of the facility. But as of right now, we have a lot of equipment that is spread out over different parts of our city buildings. In the fire department, we have stuff there, equipment there. The EOC at the county, we have uh, personal protective equipment, a ton of personal protective equipment, uh, electronics, computers, uh, laptops, phones, things uh, like that. Um, Parks and Recreations is holding um, other equipment such as uh, the cots and blankets and then we still have care kits for people in need during a flooding or, or an event such as the snowstorm that we had. So everything's scattered around and we don't have accountability at this point. Uh, we need a facility that we can uh, activate and work out of um, at a moment's notice. Like I said this morning when I made the phone call to the team members everybody was um, there within 15 minutes, but the infrastructure was not there. And that, um, that makes it difficult to operate. We didn't have any of the equipment that we needed at that point. So um, we need a place where we can secure every, everything, have accountability, have the infrastructure, and, uh, and the, the needs to be able to, to support the functions. So I would recommend that uh, that, that building facility be utilized for that can't think of a better use for that building than uh, to house uh, the EOC, something very important that we need, I mean, as seen today, right? Sure. So the only question is how fast can we get it <laughs> up to speed? Let's talk to Jesse about that. Yeah. Jesse, wait, you want to ask him? So we did, uh, you know, Mr. Rivera is working on some grant fundings uh, that FEMA is, uh, FEMA, or through FEMA, I'm sorry, and uh, some of that can be utilized for uh, EOCs and to be able to, to develop the infrastructure for buildings like that. So hopefully we get approved, but nonetheless, at least we can start. There's a lot of uh, things that we can do internally to make it right. uh, usable, 
and then as time goes on and and we acquire funding, we can come up with everything else that's Absolutely. needed. Mm -hmm. yes. do, do you still recommend uh, to do, uh, I guess, uh, to educate our citizens and maybe get together in different uh, areas to just prepare everyone in different uh, subdivisions to have leaders in case of an emergency that they cannot get to the ELC to just have them prepared and as we spoke on, on, on one of the classes that we took? Yes, absolutely. And, and those, those are some of the things that, that we're moving towards at this point. I think that uh, the priorities, Mr. Rodriguez is, is doing an incredible job at getting the priorities uh, out of the way. Uh, followed by that is the training and you know having scenarios and tabletops and having uh, citizens. Um, there does need to, we do need to create what is called a, a LEPC or a, um, local emergency, yeah. So that involves stakeholders within the community to develop plans and determine what our vulnerabilities are and be able to prepare for, for all of that, yes. Awesome, so do we have a motion to designate the former DPS building as the, the emergency management operations and we do we have a motion yes. by mayor puts in ramon yes. and a second by right. councilwoman Council cruz yes. discussion all in favor unanimous thank you thank you thank you very much all right we're going into executive session item 19 executive session pursuant to sections 551.074 and 551.071 of chapter 551 texas government code discussion of personnel and consultation with attorney ratifying interim city manager Ivan Morua in terms of employment of August 9, 2022, and possible action in open session regarding same. And item 20, executive session, pursuant to sections 551.074 and 551.071 of chapter 551, Texas government code discussion of personnel and consultation with attorney, hiring slash selection process for city manager position and possible action and open session regarding same. We are also taking item 11. Do I have to read it, Council? No, no? just, just the Item session. 11 uh, to executive session in pursuant to section 551-074 and 551-071, Texas Government Code, discussion and consultation with attorney. And we are going into executive session at 7.29 p.m. <laughs>